Hello. For tonight's Grizzly Tale, I'm going to read you a story from Grizzly Tales for Gruesome Kids. These are cautionary tales that I wrote for lovers of Squeam. Tonight's story is called... Glue to the Telly. Herbert Hinckley loves the television. He doesn't go to school, he doesn't go out to play, he doesn't have any friends. Well, he doesn't need them, because Herbert Hinckley loves the television. He sits all day in his shabby red armchair, eating packets of crisps and drinking Coca-Cola. His parents don't seem to mind. So long as Herbert is happy, they are happy. So Herbert just sits there, day in, day out, flicking between the channels, watching programme after mindless programme on a battered old television set. If you ask Herbert what any of the programmes are about, he always replies, cheese and onion. When Herbert watches the television, all he can think about is the flavour of his next packet of crisps. The television set is as old as Herbert himself. His parents bought it for him on the day that he was born. It has seen better days. The back is held on with rubber bands and garden string. The knobs on the front have long since dropped off and been replaced by lumps of half-chewed bubble gum. The screen has got a crack across it that Herbert mended with sellotape and sticking plaster. Would you like to sleep down here tonight, Herbert, as a treat? said his mother one day. Cheese and onion, said Herbert. We thought you'd like to, said Mr Hinckley. You can watch the television all night if you sleep down here. It'll make a nice change for you, said his mother, taking away the empty crisp packets and pushing a fresh bag into Herbert's lap. Although you'd never have known it, Herbert was very excited as his parents made up the sofa in the sitting room. Sleep well, dear, said Mrs Hinckley. Salt and vinegar, said Herbert, who was obviously enjoying himself because the last time he had asked for salt and vinegar, England were winning a test match against the West Indies. Herbert sat in his armchair until the little white dot disappeared from the screen. Then he got up and switched the television off at the mains. It was an old set, so this was a wise precaution. He didn't want any fires starting while he was asleep. He looked at the newspaper to check what time the breakfast show started, set his alarm and climbed into bed, exhausted after a hard day's watching. He dreamt of cheese and onion crisps. An hour later, while Herbert slept, a silver-grey cloud passed between the moon and Herbert's house. The sitting room was plunged into darkness. A streak of lightning cracked through the sky and struck the aerial that led directly into the back of Herbert's television. A switch clicked on. A faint humming sound grew from deep inside the belly of the machine. Then suddenly, blip, the television switched itself on. The little white dot that had been no bigger than a fingernail started to grow, getting larger and larger with every sleepy breath that Herbert took. It was as if Herbert and the television were breathing as one. The dot filled the screen and spread out into the room. It crept across the floor towards the sofa, edged over Herbert's pillow and onto his face. Herbert half opened one eye, but it was too late. The blinding light had completely surrounded him and suddenly, like a fisherman's net, it snatched him up and dragged him back through the television screen. Good morning, Herbert, said Mrs Hinckley when she came downstairs the next morning. Crisps for breakfast. She stopped at the door to the sitting room. Herbert? She went in and looked behind the curtains. Herbert? Mr and Mrs Hinckley could not find Herbert anywhere. He's probably turned into a television set laughed Mr. Hinckley. That's not funny, George, said his wife. But she peered into the television screen 
just in case. Herbert got the shock of his life when he opened his eyes and saw his mother's face pressed up against the outside of the screen. She looked like a giant goldfish. Only goldfish didn't have bad teeth and a big nose. Cheese and onion, he said to her, but she couldn't hear him. In fact, she couldn't see him either because he was only six inches tall. He was all alone inside his own television set. It was very dark, except for a flashing red light at the end of a narrow passage. His way forward was blocked by a big metal coil that hummed like a top. When Herbert tried to pick it up, it burnt his hand. He lay down on the floor, braced himself against an electrical circuit board, and kicked the coil as hard as he could. It snapped off and shot a jagged blue spark into the ceiling where it fizzed and crackled. Then he rolled over and crawled up the passageway towards the flashing light. As he got closer, he saw a door. He could hear a voice as well, which was strangely familiar. It was as if he'd heard it once in a dream. He eased down the door handle and slipped into the room. Inside, there was a lady sitting behind a desk. She was shuffling and reshuffling thousands of bits of paper. She turned towards Herbert as he came in, and he instantly recognised her. It was Gaynor Honeycomb, his all-time favourite newsreader. But what was she doing talking to herself? The mystery of disappearing television addict Herbert Hinckley continues today. Herbert's ears nearly dropped off the side of his head. Gorgeous Gaynor was talking about him. His parents have expressed concern for his health. They are worried that he won't be able to find enough packets of cheese and onion crisps to keep his strength up. Apparently, Herbert likes to eat at least 50 packets a day. And now the main points of the news again. Herbert was in love, and he didn't care who knew it. The gentle waft of Gainer's perfume had sent his love buds into frantic activity. He ran towards his screen goddess, calling out a name for all the world to hear. And she ignored him. She never once looked up. In fact, she went one further than that. As Herbert threw himself across the desk into her arms, she vanished. She completely disappeared, along with the desk and her bits of paper. How very odd, thought Herbert. It was just as if somebody had switched Gaynor off. Well, somebody had. Herbert's mother. She wanted to watch the cowboy film on the other side. Suddenly, an electric cable snapped off the panel above Herbert's head and crashed down into a bank of green bulbs, sending a shower of glass all over him. The cable thrashed wildly like a dying fish. Then it was still. Herbert gulped. The old television set was collapsing under his extra weight. He ran into a rusty corridor. Puddles of deadly acid oozed up from beneath the metal floor and lumps of solder dangled precariously from the ceiling like so many dead spiders. The inside of Herbert's television was a mess. He had to get out of there. There were hundreds of doors in the corridor. Herbert opened one. A little girl and a clown were sitting in the corner listening to horrible soupy music on an old gramophone. Get out, said the little girl. Can't you see we're playing noughts and crosses? Cheese and onion, said Herbert. What he meant to say was sorry. He backed out and tried the next room along. As he opened the door, a bullet whistled past his nose and buried itself into the wall behind his left ear. A heavy fist thumped him on the end of his chin, and a large pair of hands picked him up and flung him halfway across the room. Howdy, stranger, said the bartender. Enjoying the fight? Herbert was still slightly dazed as he looked up. He was in a Wild West saloon bar, in the middle of the roughest, toughest brawl he had ever seen. The bartender ducked as a bottle smashed into the mirror behind him. What you having, partner? He said to Herbert. Whiskey? A packet of cheese and onion crisps, 
please, replied Herbert. He was famished. A very large, hairy man suddenly appeared next to him. I was going to hit you with my sledgehammer, he said. Would you like that? Herbert dived behind the bar as the large, hairy man turned a perfectly nice bar stool into matchwood. Oh, it gets worse every night, said the little orange bear, who was also taking cover behind the bar. His doggy friend squeaked in agreement. I mean, why do they have to hurt each other? Oh, by the way, I'm Sooty, said the bear, and this is my friend Sweet. Oh, pleased to meet you, said Herbert. I'm Herbert Hinckley. I'm a great fan of yours. I've seen all your films. What are you doing behind this bar? Well, we're waiting to do our show, said Sooty wearily. We can't start until they finish fighting. Our viewers will be furious, you know. They want water pistols, not guns. They want to see custard pies pushed in people's faces, not chairs broken over some poor fellow's back. I mean, look! Sooty picked up a tiny chair and smashed it over Herbert's head. That's just not funny, is it? said Sooty. No, said Herbert. Not really. Then his eyes rolled upwards and he crashed to the floor. Sooty had knocked him out. When he came to, Herbert's arms appeared to be trapped by his side, but upon opening his eyes, he discovered that he was tucked up in a hospital bed. A doctor and a nurse were standing over him and gazing at each other. Nurse Paget, said the doctor. Yes, Dr. Miles, replied the nurse with a tear in her eye. The whole world thinks we're mad, said the doctor, but we're not. I can't help myself. But I love you, Nurse Paget. And I love you, Dr. Miles, she sobbed. Please, call me Tim, said the doctor. Herbert didn't know where to look as Dr. Miles and Nurse Paget threw their arms around each other and started kissing. It was like a scene out of one of those terrible television soap operas. In fact, it was one of those terrible television soap operas. That was why everyone had an Australian accent. The door burst open and a woman rushed in. She was also crying. I'm the boy's mother, she wept. She didn't look anything like Herbert's mother. Is my son going to live? The doctor put the nurse down and put his arms around this strange woman instead. Sit down, he said. Now there were tears in his eyes. I'm afraid your son will never recover. Never recover? shouted Herbert, sitting up in bed. I feel fine. I wouldn't mind a packet of cheese and onion crisp, but otherwise I've never felt better. But that's the problem, said the doctor, turning to Herbert for the first time. It's an absolute medical certainty that by six o'clock tomorrow morning, you will be a fully fried up cheese and onion crisp. You what? shouted Herbert. Look at your fingernails, said the doctor. They've already gone brown and crispy. Try one. Herbert nibbled his thumbnail and screamed. It tasted just like a cheese and onion crisp. Delicious. He took a second bite, then suddenly leapt from his bed. What am I doing? He shouted. I'm eating myself. He was going to turn into his favourite food by the morning. How could he stop himself from eating himself all up? More to the point, how could he stop himself from turning into a crisp? Where are you going? shouted the doctor, as Herbert crunched his way over to the door. He had one plan, find a shower and stand underneath it all night. One thing that Chris weren't was soggy. If he could keep himself soaking wet all night, he couldn't possibly be a crisp, and if he wasn't a crisp, there was no danger of him dying from being eaten by himself. Herbert rushed from his hospital room and found himself back in the rusty corridor. As he ran in search of water, he tripped and fell against a metal grill. A tangle of red and green cables spilled out into a quivering heap on the floor. Sparks exploded from the cables and lit a circle of small fires. Mr. and Mrs. Hinckley were still in the sitting room watching the television. I've seen enough of this hospital rubbish now, 
said Mrs. Hinckley. Let's turn over and watch the cookery programme on the other side. The one with that fat chef. Oh, yes, I like him, said Mr. Hinckley. He's very funny. Then, it's a shame Herbert's not here to see it. They switched channels and didn't notice the thin plume of smoke that had started to rise from the back of the television. Herbert was still looking for a shower room, but it was getting more and more difficult to see where he was going as smoke billowed down the corridor. Shadowy figures rushed past in the opposite direction, shouting, Fire! Fire! Get out before it's too late! Women, children and puppets first! Stop! shouted Herbert. I need to find water before I turn into a cheese and onion crisp. But nobody was listening. Even Batman and Robin ran past and pretended not to hear. Mr and Mrs Hinckley had turned over to the cookery programme. The fat cook was showing everyone how to make potato crisps. Mmm, said Mrs Hinckley. Those look so good I can almost smell them. The smoke was now rising steadily from the back of Herbert's television and filling the room. Herbert was banging on the back of the television screen. Help! he shouted. He could see his parents sitting on the sofa sniffing the air. Did you hear anything just then? said Mr Hinckley. It was the cat, said his wife. I'm in the telly! cried Herbert. Could you please get out of my way, said the fat cook, who was standing behind Herbert in the kitchen. People can't see what I'm doing. Oh, tell them, pleaded Herbert. Tell them I'm in the television. There's smoke coming out of the back, and I'm going to be turned into a cheese and onion crisp. They can't hear me. The cook was not only fat, but was also mad. You have smoke coming out of your back, and you're a cheese and onion crisp? No! I'm going to become a cheese and onion crisp. Well, if that's what you want, said the chef, picking Herbert up by the seat of his trousers. Why wait? Be a cheese and onion crisp now. He opened the oven door and slid Herbert in. Mr and Mrs Hinckley were laughing so much that they did not see the first flame leap out of the television set. Oh, that chef is so funny gasped Mr Hinckley. Did you notice when he put that extra large potato into the oven? It looked just like Herbert, screamed Mrs Hinckley as she held her sides and went red in the face. Oh look, she went on, pointing to the fire which was now blazing out of the back of the television. That chef is burning the crisps. Mr and Mrs Hinckley clutched each other fell off the sofa and rolled around on the carpet in a state of helpless hysteria. They were laughing so much that they never heard Herbert's cries for help. When they stopped laughing, the television had gone. It had burnt away to a pile of ashes. Sitting on top was a big, fat, cheese and onion crisp. Look at this mess, said Mrs Hinckley. Whatever will Herbert say when he sees what's happened to his television set? I'll buy him another one, said Mr Hinckley. This one was getting a bit old anyway. I wonder where Herbert is, said his mother, unwinding the flex to the vacuum cleaner. Well, he's probably gone out, said his father. Mrs Hinckley started hoovering up the pile of ashes. Well, he can't have gone far, she said. He's left a crisp behind. She nibbled the corner. Cheese and onion, his favourite. I've never known him leave a cheese and onion. Oh, he's bound to come back to finish it. She picked the crisp up, sealed it in a Tupperware box, put it in the fridge, and unfortunately, forgot all about it. <laughs>